Yeah, thanks, Greg, and um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So um, I'm going to cover off on um, some aspects of diagnosing um, phosphorus status in cattle. Um, so usually what we're looking to do is identify if if a particular paddock or mob is, is P deficient and then try and do some assessment on whether those cattle are going to respond to a phosphorus supplement. There's two aspects to um, the, the P deficiency. The first one is whether the P intake is sufficient to meet the animal's current needs and um, the, the current P status of the animal, that is, as Rob's described, they do have body reserves that they can utilise, so their current status is an important consideration. Therefore, we're, we want to try and get a handle on the diet P, that's what they're ingesting via their feed, um, and also the amount of P in their body reserves which can be mobilised. As we know, um, low dietary P reduces pasture intake, and we expect that um, reduction in pasture intake to be in the order of 10 to 30 percent. Um, voluntary feed intake seems to decrease when we get blood P levels below about one millimole per litre. So our first priority with P supplementation is aiming to maintain maximum voluntary feed intake if possible. Um, often we can't do much about the fact that we're dealing with a relatively low quality diet because of you know, the, the nature of pea deficient soils, but if, if we can at least get them to eat their, their potential feed intake, we're, we're going to be on a path to um, getting the best possible performance from them. So in terms of thinking about pea deficiency and deciding how much of a problem we've got if we do have a problem, we've got options of increasing complexity. At the most basic, we can think about things like cattle behaviour, experience in the country and the history of what's gone on and the performance of cattle. We can look at um, soils analyses, we can look at pasture analyses, uh, faecal analysis and also um, analysing blood for pea levels. And the final option is um, looking at bones as in looking at the phosphorus content of bones. However, because that basically involves surgical procedures, it really is only suitable for um, research type situations. Um, bone chewing everyone's pretty familiar with. Um, it was established um, over 100 years ago in Africa that linked bone chewing to severe phosphorus deficiency. And of course, it's the primary cause of botulism deaths in unvaccinated cattle. Um, that depraved appetite that comes from um, phosphorus deficiency, it's not just chewing bones, but um, you know, they'll chew sticks, stones, soil and rubbish and you know, other problems occur that, you know, where people have got old batteries and other rubbish around, their depraved appetite leads them to eating things they shouldn't be eating and, and poisonings can occur. Um, recent research has shown that bone chewing is a learned response, not innate. Um, Rob and his crew demonstrated that at Bryan Pastures, hence that photo there of um, bones in a tub. This work was done under, you know, licence and control conditions to just see how animals react and respond who are phosphorus deficient and not phosphorus deficient to the availability of bones. Um, abnormalities, um, obviously a lot of people are familiar with peg leg and that's pretty good evidence that there's a serious nutritional problem. Um, in more extreme cases, of course, you can get breaking of bones when animals are being handled in crushes. And um, sometimes when animals are being butchered or post-mortems, you can see damage to the joints and also um, soft bones generally. Um, other ways we've got to assess um, the deficiency is what do we know about soil fertility and soil P levels? Um, mapping and vegetation mapping is available. And I think it's also important that people's memories um, from before pea supplementation was very um, common could be an idea of, you know, just what the country's really like. And of course, seeing what happens when supplements are fed is an important means of assessing, you know, just what the situation is. So thinking about 
what the consequences are. That low dietary pea reduces that intake. We get reduced growth and reduced fertility milk um, and also calf growth. So, you know, pretty classically, you know, cattle on deficient country, we're getting lower reproductive rate, fertility's much reduced, and, you know, the growth of cattle on that country can be disappointing. Um, but it is slightly challenging in that um, the situations where you've got pea deficient soils, often they have a very long dry season, and that combined with the fact that, you know, it's inherently lighter country, poorer quality pasture species on it, that we usually have other deficiencies running in combination. So we'll have long periods of the dry season when they'll be experiencing protein and energy deficiency, um, as well as a pea deficiency. And in the growing season, they'll be battling the pea deficiency. I think it's important to recognise that changes in management over the last 20, 30, 40 years have reduced the impact of pea deficiency in in more extreme situations. And, you know, taking on two rounds of weaning and early weaning has a, had a big impact because he's just reducing the lactation demands on cows. And also, you know, supplementation has become a pretty important part of... Um, the cattle industry now, which is helping overcome the more severe um, symptoms of pea deficiency. Thinking a bit more about soils, um, soil testing is of somewhat limited value because soil pea is not uniform even within the same soil type and paddocks often contain a mix of soil types. So if cattle have got access to some better country in conjunction with poor stuff, they might well be able to meet their requirements because of the time they spend out on, on the better country. Um, when looking at soil tests, the Colwell bicarbonate pea test is the recommended method. And it's also important to think about how soil pea can, availability can vary with the pH. So the guidelines we've got there sort of generally would think about that when you've got soil P levels down around two and three, you've got an acutely deficient situation. Deficient we've got there at four to five, marginal at six to eight. And as I think Rob mentioned, once you get above eight parts a million, you're unlikely to experiencing a phosphorus problem on cattle. Um, pasture testing also suffers from the same issue in that the variation between, you know, across paddocks and most situations where we've got this problem, cattle are being run in relatively large paddocks. Um, also, animal selection is a big factor. Um, they do their best every day to get the best quality diet for themselves, so they're grazing the plants that are better quality, and they're also trying to graze parts of plants that are better quality. Um, but down bottom there, we've got some what are considered to be guidelines on you know, um, phosphorus levels in pastures as to whether you're dealing with a deficient or adequate situation. Um, but overall, we don't think there's much value in um, testing plants in, in the typical grazing situation because of the, the variation across the paddock and also the animal's ability to select. Fecal analysis to look at um, phosphorus situation. Diet digestibility and protein we know can be estimated from faecal NRS, but we cannot estimate phosphorus from faecal NRS. Um, faecal P can be measured by conventional laboratory chemistry, and it has been used to estimate diet P. Um, where cattle are on tropical pastures and they're not getting any supplement, um, either phosphorus or some concentrate supplement such as molasses or a protein meal, the diet P concentration in the late wet can be estimated reasonably from P concentration in the faeces. Um, however, there are problems because this issue of bone P mobilisation and replenishment, um, you know, m presents problems for particularly with breeder cattle. The Value of, of looking at protein and energy levels at the same time as um, diet P is that the amount of diet P they need varies with the protein and energy levels in the diet. Um, the, the more potential they've got to grow 
and lactate because of a better quality diet, the higher their pee requirement is to take advantage of that better quality diet. In the 2012 producer manual, um, there were some figures and um, indicators put in there about using a ratio of faecal pee to diet um, metabolizable energy. Um, however, the more recent research has indicated this ratio is not always going to be a satisfactory um, indicator. And so while diet P has some potential to be used, we need to treat it with a fair bit of caution. Blood sampling, um, that quote at the top there is from a review of all this some time ago. Um, it's probably the best test we've got but there are challenges with using it too, as we'll go into now. So the conclusion was that the blood pea at the end of the growing season successfully diagnosed pea deficiency in you know, the vast majority of situations when you're dealing with growing cattle, but the problem comes with applying it to the breeder portion of the herd. Out of that work, the pea screen test kit was developed um, and it's available, the kits are available from DAF. It's considered to be the best test for growing cattle. Um, as well as the blood P levels, um, faecal nitrogen analysis is also done. So we've got an estimate of what the diet quality is like. And again, that's to quantify, you know, just how good or bad the diet is because of the impact of that on their actual P requirement. The P screen test is really only valid when it's undertaken at the mid to late wet season when the cattle have been grazing the paddock for some time. Um, we can't feed animals any pea supplements during the wet season. Um, other factors might be able to influence the result we're getting and the biggest problem is going to be um, lactation in breeders. So thinking more about how we might apply this test to breeders, the best way to do it we currently have is putting a monitor group of young growing cattle in the breeder mob. So for example, you might put a mob of, you know, 25 odd steers or, or young heifers, spade heifers or something like that. And effectively we're using them to, we're going to study them to come up with an estimate of how the cows in the same paddock are traveling. Um, but, there is an issue too that um, even though the levels might look relatively low for a growing animal, the ability of cows to mobilise pea means that they can still produce reasonable weaners out of that situation. Um, so thinking about future developments, um, NIRS has the potential to give us a better handle on diet quality, which we could consider in conjunction with blood pea measures. And the work that Rob and his team have been doing is they're looking at um, developing blood markers to give us a better assessment of the pea mobilisation and replenishment that might be going on in breeders. If, if that can be cracked, we'll have a much better picture of what's going on. Um, so for further information, um, we've got a, these books are getting a bit dated, but in terms of background information, they provide a really good summation of, of where the knowledge is at and some good general recommendations on looking at the pea situation and also dealing with um, addressing a deficiency issue.